thanks again for people joining it. Let me slowly uh, start um, while we wait. The people can still join. There are some some plenary that are some some conf some um, worship are taking a bit more time to finish. So um, what are we gonna speak here uh, today? Uh, today we are gonna speak about. Uh, uh, what is the response uh, of uh, regulation, uh, but also we take it a bit broader, yeah, standards are developing initiatives, yeah, the focus will be regulation, but we can take it even broader because as we know, regulation are developing, so sometimes they develop also through standard existing, through initiative, etc. But we'll try to focus on regulation per se uh, to respond to the climate change. Um, by that, we will also uh, try to focus, of course, uh, uh, on the inclusive uh, part, yeah, of the response, the inclusive finance part of the response to climate change. Yeah, so we have uh, we have pretty uh, happy uh, to have here a set of panelists that I think uh, are very much complementary, and so we will try really to explore the various facets. So we will have Babak from the Toronto Center, that uh, we start as a speaker. Then we will have Janet from Afi and the Inclusive Green Finance and uh, Margherita. Uh, from the Superintendencia de Economia Popular Solidaria de Ecuador. So what we are lucky about this set of panels is that we have different uh, view and different role. So we really try to cover all aspects. I'm gonna, I have really the pleasure to moderate uh, this panel. What I think uh, I was so keen when I heard about this panel because uh, we have been spending the last uh, couple of years, uh, as someone of you know, we were redeveloping our nice green index within the European microfinance platform and the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group. And one of the main things we uh, were asked to was to look into the existing regulation initiative and standard and to be sure that whatever we develop is also aligned and put a framework that could be aligned also in the future with existing and forthcoming regulation. So let me start uh, with some introduction. As uh, someone of you has been following probably the opening plenary, I would just like to remark that the climate change is a reality. Yeah, we still heard somewhere that some people are doubting, but that's not the case. A is a reality, so it's a scientific reality, so it's the best we have in terms of understanding, and it is caused by human. Yeah, you will see uh, this plot is the temperature of our Earth. I would like to state is the average one. Yeah, in some places it's going much much worse. Uh, in the last 2,000 year as well in the last uh, 150, 170 year, and you will see how uh, we can clearly see that observed trends in temperature yeah, are totally uh, uh, going in the direction of the cause of climate change, uh, as well as this cause is due uh, to the human uh, um, intervention. Moreover, it's not just about having an increase in temperature. Yeah, it's not an ethical principle. Yeah, the temperature increases we don't want because we like our planet Earth, but it's also having a strong impact on ourselves. So we are basically throwing something to the planet and the planet is throwing these things back to us through the window. So the number of increased cost and causality with the majority basically driven by climatic event is growing. And you will see uh, this is cost. I also tend to believe this is just partial. Yeah, and it's getting and it will get uh, worse and worse. Uh, and no, 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 no matter what we do, we'll get worse uh, for the next years to come. So we need to prepare. Um, interesting enough, if you look uh, the World Economic Forum uh, that I like every year, what are the global risks, you will see that the highest one has to do with climate and environment. So you will see top right uh, climate action failure. Yeah, you will see extreme weather event. You will see human environmental damage. You will see biodiversity losses and infection diseases. So that's pretty uh, interesting that we really start realizing that uh, environmental and climatic risk are financial risk. There are some issues and some path towards solution. Yeah, so what are the issues? Okay, there is a risk, but which are the risks? How much is the risk when we understand what is the risk? And then uh, what is or will be the impact of such risk on the financial system? Yeah, that's a key question at the regulatory perspective because we need to ensure you know financial stability of uh, the financial system once we understand that we cannot stop there the question is uh, how to mitigate this risk yeah how to find solution what are the solution for this risk i would like to share with you maybe two words on a, on a, on a, on the framework we used to use uh, within yapu and we've been implementing that in various projects with the united nations for environment because 
we need to understand that risk come, for example, from vulnerability to climate change. And vulnerability is a concept that is a bit uh, complex. It's not just about there is a thunderstorm and you're vulnerable. It's about at least three elements. So A, what is happening? So climate change is, are, you know, are, is a threat. Yeah? So you could be exposed or not to that. It depends where you are. You get more exposed in some places in the earth and less in other. So this is about exposure. It's a reality that depends on the location. You cannot change unless you move. And that will have to do with migration, yeah? climatic migration. The other is about it. Uh, are you sensitive uh, to this exposure? Yeah? So it depends what you do. Uh, you can cultivate lands, yeah? or you can maybe do a taxi driver or just work into your office. And that clearly will be more or less sensitive to such uh, threats. And that is important as well. So you can change it by change it what you do. You change your job, you change your activity, you change your crop you cultivate. And the last but not least is how adapted you are. So what are your adaptive capacity? That means what are the practices and technology used to implement uh, uh, your activities? And that, for example, is the place where usually uh, inclusive finance tend to act, yeah? because you can improve the practices, uh, you can improve the technology by then reducing the vulnerability. So you're more vulnerable, the more you're exposed, the more you're sensitive, and the less you have adaptive capacity. So one of the main things of inclusive finance is how do we develop adaptive capacity? But what are the risks? We will hear from our panelists. There are two main risks in climate change. One are the physical risks for the financial sector. The physical risk, uh, yeah, that's uh, basically your portfolio can be impacted by a climatic event. So you're investing in something, and then these things you are investing to, yeah, is affected directly. The thunderstorm and the got destroyed. Then there are the transaction risks. The transaction risk, uh, how your, your institution will be affected by the fact that uh, customer regulation are tend to adapt to a decarbonized economy. So financial as a risk in terms of this transition toward a more sustainable economy, we generate risk that you need to uh, support because you need to adapt. There are two key items that I would like you to be aware of while you will listen our new panelist is about there are two key um, elements taken into account. One is disclosure. Now, it's very important to disclose. Yeah, so what are the risks? Um, what they are and where they are. I just put here a couple of examples. Right? There's our initiatives, task force on climate related financial disclosure, task force on nature related disclosure, just example. We need to understand where they are, so we need to disclose. And then there are solutions, but the solution, for example, is how do we cope with that? For example, with better practices. But then we need to understand, okay, what is green? Yeah, for example, for climate change adaptation and mitigation, what are the things that we can name it that are contributing to adapt and mitigate climate change and there we need very much need to pay attention to the greenwashing and to understand what is green and what is not green. Here there is a sort of gold reference standard, the EU taxonomy, but many other are developing will be heard. Yeah, this is just a, an example. Two words before giving the word to the, our new panelist. Uh, um, as someone knows, I have the pleasure also to have together with Natalia Real Pecarillo, uh, the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group. And uh, we see here how the Green Inclusive Finance can support uh, to reduce such risk for us uh, uh, and for the sector in the inclusive finance sector, we see the inclusive finance sector as a solution, yeah, because compens works to our reducing the vulnerability, as we discussed above, to our reducing the adverse impact to the ecosystem that is related to the transition risk and to our finding economic opportunities to do so. As you know, we, recently we have been improving and we have been working on the Green Index that is existing since 2014, developed by the Action Group, Climate and Green, Climate Smart Finance Action Group. Why I'm saying that? Because it's our small contribution to support the inclusive finance sector to set up standards and to support into risk management also for climate change. Yeah? While doing that, you see that was a path from 2013, 2016, 2021 just now, in the last two years, 2020 and 2021, we had a, very, a lot of pressure and suggestion that whatever we will put new into the sector should not only fulfill the needs of the sector, but also being aligned to international initiatives. So that is really why I think this panel is so important because we've been spending a lot of time to align to national initiatives. We have been working uh, within the green industry review uh, initiatives, regulation and standard. Uh, uh, we have been not, of course, been able to do a full review. Yeah, many things is happening. We have been going through around 70 plus. Yeah, and you see here non exhaustive list between uh, initiative, regulation, framework, etc. And uh, to ensure uh, that all this setup is included into this green index. So that's when one financial institution is using that is also able to disclose the financial risk 
uh, and the climate risk uh, and the physical risk uh, um, and how to mitigate and find solution uh, to its investor regulation, etc. Last but not least, we will hear the, from our colleagues uh, how to uh, mitigate such risk. And I also would like to highlight that within the European Microfinance Platform, the Green Inclusive and Climate Smart Finance Action Group, again, will be so pleased to be in contact with many of you listening to us and uh, people also here, speakers in the audience together with the AFI also have been working on that is how then to uh, um, manage the risk within the, <clears throat> within the greenness risk release, this framework that uh, would allow financial institution, microfinance institution to manage such climatic risk. We have a set of standards. You will see below the path for risk management. You identify your risk, your risk identification. You analyze uh, the risk within the green index. You try to respond to the risk within processes. So how do you include into your loan processes, risk policies and policy? Yeah. And then you try to find a response. Yeah. How can, how can you provide financial and non-financial services to reduce uh, the climatic risk and to generate uh, resiliences to the clients? Yeah. And then when you do it, you go back and you go back here on the point four and you monitor the risk. So have you been able by doing point three the 2.3, respond to processes and product and services to reduce uh, the risk that you've been identified at point one. And if you did, good. So keep on doing it. And if not, try to find another way to do it. With that, I'm so happy to leave the floor uh, to our first speaker. And it is going to give us uh, the uh, introduction, an explicit example on how to do it. So Babak, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot to have you. Thank you very much, David. And by the way, that was a very good uh, presentation. One of the advantages I have uh, that I'm going after you, the scientist. So you're the one who's uh, setting the context. And the context was actually really useful for my presentation. I'm happy to be here today. Congratulations to the European Microfinance Platform for organizing this successful conference. Toronto Center has been a member of your organization since 2017. And I've also been to Luxembourg on a couple of occasions. Uh, I'm going to provide a bit of an overall context, but that would complement what uh, Davida talked about. Then I'm going to delve into a couple of key issues, which is a relationship between financial stability and financial inclusion. Then I'll talk about the SDGs and situate the climate into that discussion and then make the link back to uh, financial inclusion before I pass it on to my other colleagues and greetings to my colleagues from uh, AFI and Ecuador as well. So next slide, please. Next. So I really do believe that the overall context we're in is a perfect storm. Um, next slide. Sorry, next. Uh, yeah. And next one. So think about the world we're living in right now. We're still getting kicked around by the pandemic. Uh, governments are fiscally constrained. There's poor vaccine rollout. In fact, Europe itself is lagging behind. Uh, we're lucky here in Canada, but just to the south of us, there's a lot of anti-vaccine sentiments and everything. And in the developing countries, we read about how only about three to 10% of the populations are fully vaccinated. And it really seems like every country is for itself, uh, which is terrible. Uh, that general sense of global cooperation seems to be waning. Stress and mental health are everywhere. On certain global order, I don't have to say very much other than using the word Trump, you know, that can come back at any time. And this is really part of the, the anxiety that we're all feeling. And climate risk is really situated in that. Now, the developing countries and emerging market countries, EMDEs, they really are at the taking the brunt of all of this. And next um, click. So for an organization like Toronto Center, this ongoing turbulence creates a lot of challenge of how to prepare supervisors to lead in turbulent times. Next, please. So we were established in 1998. Uh, we, we have trained about 15,000 or more uh, central bankers and supervisors from 190 countries and jurisdictions, majority of which are in developing countries and emerging markets. We focus on both on stability of the financial system. That's when you show up to the bank and you still have money and financial inclusion, increasing access, financial stability. I think if uh, you need a refresher for those who are non-regulators uh, could be issues around crisis preparedness, risk-based supervision, macroprudential surveillance, all the serious stuff you read about the credit risk and financial inclusion. I think I can take a pass on this one because um, this crowd probably knows a lot about it. And uh, just a note to our funders in the previous slide, we're very grateful for their support, Canada, Sweden, uh, uh, and uh, others. Next one, please. 
Uh, so this is a trick question, which is more important, financial stability or inclusion? Sometimes I think we're the only ones who care about this. And I give you a spoiler alert. I think they're both important. Next one, please. Just so that you don't think I'm making it up, there's a study by the uh, IMF, in fact, was quoted in the uh, speech of the IMF's deputy uh, managing director in 2017, that risk to financial stability increase when access to credit is expanded without proper regulation and supervision. So investing in high quality supervision can pay dividends as financial inclusion expands. So think of the relationship as such. You are working very hard in the space of financial inclusion, microfinance and your other colleagues elsewhere are working on microinsurance and a lot of gains are being made. People in developing countries are taking advantage of cell phones far more than many of us are in the developed countries for transactions. But think of all those financial crises that have happened in our lifetimes. The net result is millions and millions upon people are thrown right back into poverty as if we have to start from scratch. So the relationship is very real. Next. So that's the best way I could depict it as a Venn diagram where good supervision is the connected tissue between the two. And it's really, that's really what we do at Toronto Center. So that's just by way of biography. Um, next slide. So when you think about expanding access, you're also supporting SDGs and uh, you know, ESGs. So good supervision and stability enable the citizens to save, borrow, invest money, protect themselves and their assets. And it's, it's all part and parcel. So I really do reject the notion where serious people with business suits and ties talk about financial stability and then uh, NGOs and others talk about financial inclusion. The two sides really got to talk together a lot more. And you know, I, I know that Afi is doing a lot of good work in that space. So we welcome uh, anyone who can actually bring that dialogue to fore. And just by way of uh, research, uh, you know, when you look at the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, there's about 17 of those goals. And we have uh, basically estimated six of them are directly related to uh, the work that financial regulators and supervisors do. The three prominent ones are here, but also there's another, uh, five or six, so about 11 of the 17 are directly related to the financial system. And think about it, financial system is like that pipe, piping system that you need to have. So there's a lot of plumbing involved. So we, we often joke that our training, our capacity building is like plumbers teaching plumbers. So you can have all the best rules and regulations in the world, but if you don't know how the system works and how to enforce it, all of that uh, is for nothing. And when it comes to SDGs and ESGs, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the E and the S, environment and social, as critical as they are and as relevant as they are to this conversation today. It's the governance that can make or break it. The starting point of a lot of our courses are good governance. With good governance, you have a good understanding of risk. Once you start thinking about risk, you think about all the emerging risks that are out there and climate is becoming one. Next one, please. So climate has not been an issue for supervisors and regulators uh, all along, you know, and, uh, you know, it's interesting. I remember a few years ago when we were talking about it, it was as if like you're sitting in a boardroom and people just pushed their chairs back as soon as the word climate came. And it had a lot to do, I think it has a lot, had a lot to do with the fact that climate advocacy began with scientists and activists. Just in the last uh, round of COP26, uh, all the people who are tasked with working on these issues were shamed by a young exuberant activist saying nothing but blah, blah, blah. But there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes on this. I think it's best put by the words of the governor of the Central Bank of Mexico, who spoke at our event at COP26 just earlier this month. I mean, it's worth taking a look at it. Climate change is materializing as credit risk. Again, when I say credit risk, think about the serious people beginning to pay serious attention in the financial sector. Credit risk is what brought this financial system down in 2008. Just think of California's uh, Pacific Gas and Electric Company that went bankrupt because of climate issues. If we don't pay attention to climate risk, there will be grave consequences. So he cites the case of Mexico where physical and transition risks are causing shocks that could threaten the stability of the financial sector. And the last, bullet is really important here. So the fact that climate is not a direct part of our mandate, 
it does not mean that central bankers and supervisors can turn a blind eye to it. We've been on this marching uh, uh, point for a number of years as Toronto Center. So next one, please. Next. Yeah, so we began our climate courses back in 2015 before climate was a sexy notion or even discussed in the financial sector. Notwithstanding the fact that it has been a topic of a major discussion in the civil society and in the scientific community. And uh, next one, please. And we've had a number of courses. Um, next one. Try to uh, put together some very high quality executive panels to bring the issue to four. Here we uh, featured uh, Mark Carney and also Siri Mugliani, who's a member of the Council of uh, Finance Ministers on Environment and a score of other webinars and podcasts and other things that talked about this issue. And uh, next one, and also a number of publications. So the most concrete one recently was a publication that we have on a climate risk toolkit for financial supervisors. The aim here was for that lonely supervisor who sits in the developing countries without much support. How do they even get started? How do they see the connection between all these fancy literature they read everywhere work of scientists, sometimes they don't understand how do they access all that. And I think the validity of this work became clear to us because during the conversations in the webinars and courses, questions were very basic on the part of supervisors. I was telling David a couple of days ago that uh, in 2018, we had a course in Toronto Center, not on climate, on something different, but climate was a topic of one session. And we asked the question about how important is climate change, climate risk in your jurisdiction? And everybody there was exclusively from, in, 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 uh, completely from developing countries and emerging markets, a lot from Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, almost every one of them said, it's not an issue for us. So you can just see how it's all evolving. Next one. So I'm very pleased that today, finally, climate is change is considered a mainstream risk to the financial sector. And as I try to paint a picture for you, that wasn't always the case. And I think it's important to bear for a second to just to pause and talk about what does that mainstreaming means. We all know about the physical risk. We feel it day to day at our doorsteps, flooding and fires, everything else that we see, hurricanes. And, um, but also financial regulatory authorities are beginning to recognize climate change as a threat to financial stability, alongside the risk to housing market, indebtedness, and cyber attacks. And um, next one, please. Financial institutions could sustain large losses as a result of transition and physical risks. And I think Davide did a really good job of explaining what those are. There's something very ironic here. The more a country tries to deal with the impact of physical risks, the more they expose themselves to the difficult tasks of the transition risks. Those of us who live in resource-rich countries like Canada, Mexico, many of developing countries out there, we know the pain that it's gonna to take to transition versus those jurisdictions that are not in any way dependent on extractive industries. And that's just one issue. And uh, you know, as you look at this, it's really that paradox is about how the financial industry, financial system is managing its own risks. Once you regard it credit risk, uh, climate change as a credit risk, you have to evaluate all your portfolios everywhere. And you have to have transparency as a big part of what you do. And are the regulators really prepared for that? These are really perennial questions. And quantifying transition risk and, and implementing appropriate disclosures are becoming very essential. Disclosure is really key to many of these. It's a brand new topic of conversation that I feel a lot of people are talking about today. But I had the privilege of working for a very large institutional investor in the early 2000s. And I actually benefited from a work that they did as soon as I joined. They, my organization was a signatory to the UN Principles for Responsible Investing, PRI. And there we were exposed to the topics of ESG before ESG again became very uh, prominent. And disclosure is really key. I mean, think of it this way. We're all trying to figure out what to do. We try to um, invest in ETFs, mutual funds, or whatever financial plan that we have, and we want to be sustainable. But do you, do you and I really know the 
in the, scope, the, the impact of uh, you know, GHGs and others in the portfolios that we invest for our retirement and for our kids' education? I really don't think so. I mean, take a look at any sustainable um, ETF or mutual fund. I bet you you'll find the name of a lot of companies that you also find in the main index, but at a higher uh, management expense ratio. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but you should take a look at it. So, and greenwashing is a very interesting thing. You don't even need to say you're greenwashing, but you get all kinds of publicity out of it. But gives puts people in this dangerous zone where they think things are happening, when in fact they're not. So I was very pleased that the G7 earlier this year backed making disclosures mandatory, especially in the financial sector. And it was very important that at the COP26, they also talked about it in the context of the financial sector. Next slide, please. So, you know, going back to, again, what some other activists and others have talked about, uh, you know, all talk and no action. I think it's important to know that a lot is happening. Next. I'm not really much of an artist, but I wanted to create a sense that we were talking about an alphabet soup is a bit of a jigsaw puzzle here and not all the puzzles pieces are fitting together. They should be. There's all kinds of intentions for the puzzle pieces to fit together. But I think more work is, needs to be done. Some of the pieces of this puzzle think, oh my gosh, shit, I have to deal with climate now. I'm getting dragged into it. Some others are, have been engaged from day one, the UN and the G20. But what's encouraging is they are beginning to change the landscape. So just let me pick on a few of them that I know. The World Bank and the IMF, every uh, four or five years, they go into countries and do something that's called financial sector assessment programs. They really examine everything about the financial sector, its resiliency in that country. And they're beginning to incorporate uh, climate change risks in some of their FSAPs on a pilot study. And they're gonna make it pervasive and uh, persistent. So that's actually fantastic. That's gonna make a lot of changes because it's gonna put pressure on and encourage supervisors and regulators and central bankers to really look at this as a legitimate issue. You have the NGFS, the Network for Green and Financial System. So this is the coalition of central bankers. And David, I think you mentioned that in your presentation as well. And they're doing a lot of good work. They're focusing on stress testing, scenario analysis. Uh, I know Canada and many countries are participating in that. And more as, more as we learn more and more about those initiatives, the more it will translate into the work of the supervisors and regulators on the ground. And uh, TCFD, David talked about it as a, finance, as a private sector initiative, but again, it's all about disclosure. Disclosure is part of their name. And uh, we're beginning to see standard setters. So Basel Committee, uh, uh, International Association for uh, Insurance Supervisors and others beginning to issue guidance, beginning to look at climate in a very serious way. And why not? If you think about it, the insurance sector was at the forefront of uh, climate and environmental damages before even these terms were used in this sense. So there's no reason why supervisors need to be behind. So the catching up is great and a lot of good work is happening. So we're very delighted that although we were a pioneer in this space, we're no longer alone. It's really important. And uh, next one. Barak, I should need to ask you to wrap up because we are going a bit yeah. over time. I just have one last slide, thank, thank you. you. And uh, next one, next one, please. And uh, next one as well. So let me bring it back together. This is really the final point that I wanted to make is that financial inclusion being a connective tissue for a lot of these things that are happening in the SDGs and the fact that we establish a connection between that financial inclusion, financial stability is really important that gender equality and climate change priorities be included in that because of the impact on the people, the vulnerable, the climate resiliency, that's really critical. And uh, the resource mobilization uh, implications are huge and capacity building plays a very key role. So in a nutshell, final to finalize everything, is that we need to look at this from a holistic perspective, not as the domain of some people who are looking at this risk, some people looking at that risk. And uh, with that, I turn it back to David. Thanks again. So thanks a lot for this uh, complete and inspiring uh, introduction and explanation to the topic. Uh, and I, I really think that uh, highlighting the connection also between inclusion 
Yeah. The stability is, is key. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, we know too little or we're aware too little about that. So I think it's, it's a key item. Yeah. I would really to put together the macro and the micro, uh, if you want to make just a financial system, the get to know each other to ensure the best for the civil society and for our economies. So I'm pleased to give the floor now to Jeanette, that's going to tell us about uh, how these things uh, uh, is elaborated, worked through, and uh, the generating past our solution into AFI Alliance for Financial Inclusion. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Davide, and uh, the context setting actually, and uh, also the box presentation gives a very good segue to what I'm going to present. But uh, just to quickly introduce uh, Alliance for Financial Inclusion, uh, it is a network of about 100 financial regulators and policymakers from more than 80 developing and emerging countries, developing countries and emerging economies. So, and uh, Within this network, uh, 50 institutions form the working group that is working on inclusive green finance uh, to generate knowledge resources and learn from each other. And uh, that leads me to my presentation, which is basically a, a very niche area, uh, focusing only on uh, financial inclusion and green finance. So next slide, please. And as mentioned uh, earlier, the 26th uh, Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC, which uh, concluded recently, yielded some good results and not so good results. And these are just are uh, these are just some of the highlights on the commitments. But uh, I won't dwell much on this. I just wanted to highlight that uh, finance is very important in the support to adaptation and resilience building and transition to low carbon development. And in addition, as elaborated by uh, in the previous presentation, it uh, poses material risk to long term and financial stability, which leads me to the next uh, slide. So uh, linking climate change and uh, financial inclusion, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, it impacts financial stability. But uh, in here, uh, I would just like to emphasize also again, uh, as mentioned earlier, the impact to vulnerable groups because climate change and environmental degradation heavily impacts the uh, these vulnerable groups who are also in most cases are the unbanked or the ones at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Uh, they have the limited coping capacities as mentioned earlier and very limited means to rebuild when disaster, uh, affect, disasters affect them. And that's where financial inclusion becomes actually very relevant. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the uh, policy framework that uh, came up after mapping out the existing uh, policy examples, which could be considered as green and inclusive across the AFI network. Most of these are market shaping policies. And uh, it is not actually surprising as uh, green and inclusive finance is a relatively new policy area. As uh, climate change in general, climate risks is getting mainstream in the financial sector. Uh, the concept of inclusivity is actually very, still very new. And uh, so for in market shaping policies, we see a lot of capacity building activities going on along with policy developments. And with also, of course, the main objective of enabling spaces for uh, green financing activities and uh, investments. And we see both uh, happening, although mostly in uh, mitigation, but uh, financial regulators are looking at adaptation and resilience building, which is very important in ter uh, terms of financial inclusion. But there are direct interventions that are already being implemented. For instance, especially this one is in the green lending space. So for instance, in Egypt, uh, the central bank offers uh, allocated funds or a refinancing facility and subsidized rates to help the transport sector 
to transition from use of uh, fossil fuel and uh, into uh, natural gas. And this is also the same with bakeries. And uh, we look at the inclusion component and this is implemented across uh, MSMEs that also owns this public transports and uh, bakeries. And then we also see green lending quota, such as in Bangladesh and in Nepal, that covers not only the big ticket projects, but also covers MSMEs in general. And then ref uh, refinancing facilities are also made available to support post-disaster recoveries. And we see most of this in the Pacific region. And next slide, please. So given these policy ex examples, uh, I would like to highlight these three policy areas that are gaining traction among regulators, which I will share uh, in more details in the succeeding slides. Uh, next slide, please. So digital finance, as mentioned, uh, presents a potential in scaling uh, in green and inclusive finance. And this was even highlighted during this pandemic. And using an ecosystem approach, uh, we looked at digital finance in terms of platforms, products, and policies. And on the platform end, uh, digital for, uh, financial services such as mobile money uh, has enabled expedited transfer of uh, social payments and aids to affected population following a climate related event. And we see these examples happening in the Philippines and uh, in Fiji. And in terms of products, whether it is for adaptation or resilience purposes, uh, these are also uh, gaining traction, like in insurance and uh, agricultural insurance and other in, uh, index insurance products in Africa and uh, Asia. And also, the pay-as-you-go scheme that enables low-income population to access uh, low carbon technologies, and we see this uh, such as, uh, for instance, renewable energy and uh, or energy efficient products like cook stoves and other low carbon technologies. And we see this again in countries such as Bangladesh, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, and uh, other African countries. Then, there, uh, then there's the third space, which is policy. Unfortunately, uh, Digital finance in general is uh, rapidly evolving uh, and uh, financial regulators are still trying to cope, at least in developing countries. So there are regulatory sandboxes in a lot of countries to understand how these innovations work as well as the risks involved. And there are a couple of few policy examples, uh, but we have yet to see more development, more policy development uh, in this uh, specific area. And uh, next slide, please. And in terms of green definitions, uh, financial regulators are also working on this uh, end, including the green data as these two are linked. And there are considerations of uh, country context and harmonizing and aligning uh, green definitions to facilitate regional and international climate finance flows. But there's also the more important question of its relevance to financial inclusion. And we, did, we see this challenge being addressed by green taxonomy developments. But then there's also the challenge of uh, integrating stronger adaptation and resilience building components that is not commonly found in published green taxonomies. Uh, although the recently published first version of the ASEAN taxonomy for sustainable finance presents a very good example. And we were looking at the adoption among the ASEAN countries. But in the absence of green taxonomy, financial regulators have also taken the initiative to define green in, other, in their policies, such as, for example, in green banking guidelines. And we see this in Bangladesh and in Pakistan, as well as in ESRM guidelines, in financial sector strategies like sustainable finance and green finance strategies. And uh, at the moment also, they're now trying to uh, make green finance policies uh, very inclusive. And uh, we see this one at the moment. Uh, Papua New Guinea is currently developing is its national inclusive green finance policy. And it follows also for green data. 
given the challenges in defining what is green, uh, that uh, data needs is also uh, defining data needs is also challenging. And uh, in in terms, uh, be it in the demand side or the market data, the supply side or disclosures and uh, risk data. But what we see in the network is that, for instance, on the demand side data, uh, the Reserve Bank of Fiji in its demand side survey included climate vulnerabilities already to understand the demand uh, for finance that will help in resilience building and adaptation, as well as their interest in low carbon technologies. So this, uh, the result of this survey will then inform the updating of their national financial inclusion uh, strategy. And next slide, please. And on gender, uh, this is one of the highlights also of the COP26. And these are also being considered in financial regulation, especially for financial inclusion. And these are uh, just some of the key points that uh, financial regulators are looking at in the AFI network. So recognition of women vulnerabilities and their role in resilience building and adaptation, as well as in low carbon development are key considerations. Therefore, policies and processes must be ensured to be gender sensitive, uh, ideally gender transformative and developed in consultation with women. So in addition to these developments, uh, we also see financial regulators already integrating uh, green elements into national financial inclusion strategies, either as uh, one pillar of their NFIS, or as a specific uh, policy. And we see this in South Tomen Principe in Bangladesh, as well as in the Solomon Islands. So to, con to conclude, uh, green and inclusive finance plays a critical role in uh, ensuring uh, that the most vulnerable groups, including women, adapt and build their resilience to the impacts of climate change and contribute to low income carbon development. Uh, financial regulators and policymakers in general in developing countries have started addressing uh, climate change and they're also establishing coordination mechanisms with uh, various stakeholders of green and inclusive finance. But uh, as they are also relatively new in this policy area, they may also need uh, guidance, additional knowledge and perspectives and from private uh, sector practitioners, from uh, implementers, from uh, other countries, from international organizations, and everyone else, including all of us. So I think that caps my presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Jeanette. Uh, really complementary to what said before and with a very rich example of what is uh, happening by, by in various countries uh, with different challenges and possible solutions, as well as the transversal view with digital uh, solution with gender. Uh, that is, of course, uh, key and, of course, access to data. And with all that, I would like to pass the, the micro uh, to Margarita that is going to tell us uh, Okay, what is actually happening on the ground when we focus on a specific um, reality, in this case, uh, Ecuador and l'economia solitaire. Uh, please, to you the mic. Thank you so much. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce you a little bit about the work that we are doing from the Superintendencia de Economia Popular y Solidaria in Ecuador about green finance, specific the regulatory response to climate, climate change. Next, please. So I want uh, to show you a little bit about what uh, we have prepared for today. Next, please. And uh, we want to start to show you what is the superintendencia, what we are doing. Next, please. And, um, I want to thank you not only for this uh, invitation, so for uh, all of you to introducing the topics with such a precision and clarity, because the organizations that we control in the popular and solidarity economy are more than uh, 16,200. Uh, and in these organizations, uh, we have more than 5 million, 500 uh, people who are working to be 
uh, but not only for this sector uh, in the financial um, uh, in, in the financial uh, activities, so then for the production activities, and that's why we are working together to show the better way to all these people and all these organizations to work uh, in a better perspective for climate change. Next, please. Next. So our financial uh, sector had now uh, 497 entities. These entities have uh, financial service points in all the country, and more than 50% of these points are in uh, parishes with high rurality and high poverty levels. Next, please. Now we want, uh, we want to talk about the real popular and solidarity sector, so the organizations who are producing uh, or giving services. Next, please. In this context, we have more than 16,000 entities, 50% for these organizations are concentrated in the production se sector, and 65% uh, of the producto production organizations are entities of the farming sector. Next, please. Now, why we are working in financial inclusion? Next, please. We in the superintendencia have a strategy and our strategy, as you can see, have one uh, axis for financial inclusion with gender perspective, financial education, green finance and digital financial services. That's we, why we understand that this way is the way to do our work in the, uh, in the right way, not only for the financial system, but then for our country. And we have another axis for straightening with financial stability, customer protection, and strategic partnerships to work not only with our organizations in the country, so to, to make this net to uh, prepare this climate change reaction for our sector uh, in the better way. Next, please. So why we want to, to work? In, in, uh, in climate change. If you think about Ecuador, uh, our country is one of the 17 mega diverse countries with two point, uh, sorry, 9.2 species per square uh, kilometer. And we are in the first uh, ranking for biodiversity. We have 121 areas of conservation, the Galapagos Island, uh, 17 volcanoes, 10% uh, for the species of amphibians, mammals, and uh, vascular plants are in Ecuador. 20% of the world birds are in Ecuador with more than 1,600 species, 17,000 insect species, and seven, uh, seven important river basins. So ensuring the protection of biodiversity of our country is key because that allows us and the world to balance proper functions of the ecosystem. That's why we need to implement a mitigation and adaptation strategies against climate change. Next, please. And why the organizations that work with us have to understand this problem? Because the effects of climate change in Ecuador are already there. Uh, climate change constitutes a critical risk for Ecuador, and we are already there. Poverty, inequity, inequity uh, insecurity, unemployment, and the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic make it essential now to trace a route to economic reactivation for the perspective of sustainable social inclusion with environmental responsibility. Next, please. So the sector that we control is now 13% of the national financial system. And this part of the financial system in Ecuador is responsible for 70% for of the microcredits that we have in our financial system. And that is really, really important if you think about MSMEs and all the work that the entities that we control doing, are doing in the, in the farming sector. So the principles of the popular and solidarity economy consider social and environmental responsibility. And that's why we in SEPs are working on the implementation of measures that favor the mitigation and adaptation of the effects of climate change. Um, in the main, promote the development of green finance, 
reducing the carbon, the carbon emissions, uh, the reduction of dependence of non-renewable uh, resources, and the implementation and strengthening of natural environments conservation practices in primary sector like the agriculture. Next, please. So uh, if we think what is happening in Ecuador uh, about green finance, we can show you that in 2008, the constitution of, of the Republic of Ecuador already makes an explicit reference to the issues of climate change and the country's commitment to this mitigation. Uh, we have already a national strategy of climate change. Uh, this strategy is now, uh, it has now uh, fast, uh, more than nine years to, to work with and we have to, uh, to gain the, the, the goals of this strategy in 2025. In 2019, um, uh, the draft standard of green finance determines the, requirement, the requirements and conditions of the financing of credit lines and uh, of the entities from the popular and solidarity financial sector. In 2020, inclusive uh, green finance virtual training with AFI allowed us to aim key participants uh, from the state and the sector and the persons for the SEPs official control entities were, uh, were there to, to learn more about this field. In 2021, uh, we make a workshop directed for, for the entities, uh, for our uh, controlling sector for, uh, sector, for the integration and organization and public institution to show them the guidelines for the management of social and environmental risk. And we are working in this effort with AFI. Uh, AFI helped us in this effort to developing financial inclusion policies. Uh, and uh, we participated in a work, working group to, to create an inclusive and environmental responsible financial ecosystem. And as controllers, we want to activate the participation uh, virtual and face-to-face -face in meetings and workshops uh, to be prepared for this challenge and um, gain that the sector that we are controlling now um, have a, a, a really um, ca can make a difference in our financial system. Next, please. So now uh, we have to, to see what, what we have, what we are doing in, in Ecuador, this framework to action for the SEPs in green finance. And uh, we know that we have to work in this interinstitutional cooperation with the regulators uh, and with the entities to draft the standard of green finance. And we are fast there, I think, um, in this year, we can, we can have it already, the, 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 the regulation for that for our sector. And the, the, um, the main thing about this, this regulation is the definitions of green products. Uh, and I think if we can do it, then we have to work with the sector to make them together to work with us, not only to um, achieve the goals for the norm, so then to be prepared to do the things with this new uh, mindset and do the best for the people who are uh, in the sector. Next, please. And to understand what we have to do in, in our work, we, we make a diagnosis for the environmental and social risk management. And uh, the, the big conclusion for, for this uh, diagnosis was that the introduction of a regula regulation on environmental and social risk management by the SEPs and its subsequent implementation will constitute a, a the, the right and pioneering in the, in the intervention in the region and in the cooperative sector that could serve as a, an example and guide for other regulations in uh, regulators, sorry, in Latin America. We have to implement the regulation uh, and this regulation must be carried out in a compulsory or gradual manner, depending on the segmentation of the entities, the segmentation length and, the, and the, how big or how small is one entity. Uh, we have to make an accompaniment in the in the SARAS implementation process for the entities, specifically in the in the cooperatives, in the credit unions. 
And then we have to develop an incentive system that motivates the entities to work with this regulation. Next, please. Uh, Mark, uh, I should need to ask you to wrap up if possible, because we're going to be- Yes, <laughs> yes, uh, two more slides, thank you. So uh, what we are worried about is because if we say the evaluation of um, environmental and social risk management uh, in, in, in Ecuador, in our entities, one of the main results is that 49% of the entities consider that the implementation of a S a MSMEs uh, should be optional. Uh, and that is that is really really uh, um, a problem for us because we want the entities to work with us in this in this field. Next, please. And uh, finally, we want to let you know that we are working now with with AFI in a no refundable technical assistance uh, to have the guidelines for the management of social and environmental risk. And we want to uh, make an, an emphasis here because one of the principles of the cooperative is, is the commitment with the community. And we are sure with this commitment, we can change a lot of things um, um, in aim with this, with this uh, compromise that we have with climate change. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Margarita. It was fantastic and really uh, to the ground. Yeah, challenges that we have ahead, uh, how to really do it that practically. And uh, as you said, uh, if uh, an important part of the member thinks it should not be mandatory, yeah, that still you say, okay, we have a problem because it means that the, that the risk is still not perceived as material. So I think uh, that was of key importance. So, uh, so we are a bit uh, uh, with the time, but we have time for the for some questions. So before asking questions, I could have in my head, if anyone wants to pose a question, we have two ways to do. You put in the chat or eventually we can even give the micro if someone wants to ask that's alive. So don't be shy, uh, just do it. And, um, and I'm happy to take uh, some questions from you. Um, I'm not I'm wrong, I don't see open questions. So in the meantime, we'd like to ask one thing uh, that we're really coming from what I heard. When you develop, you know, standard, we were speaking about, okay, you need to disclose risk, but which kind of risk? You need to tell us what, what is green and what is not green, like getting into taxonomy, et cetera. How are you, or would you suggest uh, to ensure um, that this kind of norm are not just normative, you know, coming from what should be, but also are informed by what is possible to do at the stage where we are. So how do we involve, uh, uh, or how should we? Maybe you will just say, no, we should not do it. Yeah, it's just a, a, a question from, uh, from the ground, uh, how we could involve, or we should involve the civil society, the financial intermediary, private and public, uh, uh, the end customer, et cetera, into shaping what the norm of what we should disclose and what we should do in terms of green, is should we do or should we not and if we should uh, how to do it in an effective way while respecting what really green is but at the same time by per, by allowing that we can really move from where we are to where we would like to go please anyone that want to answer um, maybe i can just uh, say something very quickly i think this is really a critical point and it really comes down to i think the way you said it which is the, uh, the, the disclosure should be about how it's going to further the transition to net zero, right? So what can be uh, measured can be managed. And uh, what is like in, in certain cases is very simple in extractive industries, but when it comes to the financial sector, all those loans and everything that are going to support fossil fuels and others are as long as we know what they are. And again, here, the point is not to shut down fossil fuels right away. I mean, my colleague from Ecuador knows that that can cause a lot of pain, but it's about understanding the contribution of that to this net zero transition. Today, we're in a world where we're doing all this stuff and then yet, you know, world leaders are going and asking OPEC to pump even more oil, right? And they just finished the COP26. So it's a very intricate dance that's happening. But it all comes down to the way your question was framed. Almost, David, it sounds like a rhetorical question. You had your answer in your question, which I think is really important. Disclosure is 
to the end that you want to achieve, not just disclosure for disclosure's sake. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Davide. Maybe I could contribute on, on the green definition side. And uh, maybe one thing that's very important here uh, that we see in countries that have already, uh, that are already working on this is uh, multi-stakeholder coordination. And this talks about how financial regulators uh, coordinate with uh, other stakeholders involved. Uh, be it the private sector, uh, the private sector, be it other regulators. So we see the coming of uh, different government institutions talking about this green finance. Uh, there are climate policies and other uh, environment related policies in the country, but uh, other sectors that are affected must also be involved. And we see here like uh, uh, the really the importance of uh, the inclusive approach and uh, consultative approach to all these uh, stakeholders uh, involved, especially in defining what is green as uh, this cause for a somewhat political decision when uh, they def start to define which activities are green and which are not. There'll be a lot of uh, debates on that. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Margarita, do you want to add? If not, we have a question. Uh, we have yes. asked questions and uh, that we will take that those to close. Please, Margarita. So I, I just want to say, if, if you ask, the result is, is likely to be related to the cost uh, rather than the need. But you have to get them, uh, so the, the, the persons who are involved in this process, to think more about the result uh, and the need that you have to change the things that about the cost. And, and that's why it's so important, and I speak from, from Ecuador, to change the mindset, because we want to think and work in the right way to reduce climate change um, effects, not only something that you have to show because it's really nice to show. You have to work with that because you really believe that you can make a difference. And, and I think that is the, this coordination that, that Janet already tell. And, and that's why, as Baba said, Baba said you have to, to think about how much costed, but you have to do it. If you have to do it, it's OK. Thanks a lot. So I'm going to take the two questions we receive, and I will tend to conclude with that. Please. Uh, one keep on one question and one the other is not addressed to anyone in particular but are two questions for everyone so one is what do you think about caps and interest rate as a way to promote a specific activity in this case for example adaptation or mitigation activity in your experience in your experience do they work so think who want to answer to this and the other question by rugamar uh, bodupali is increasing requirement of risk capital to mfis cope with the black swan events, extreme weather events, how regulation can respond quickly in real time. So the quickness of the response that is needed. Yeah? So, and then we'll conclude with this one, I think. Please, who want to answer to the first and the second, the, 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 the question, one is in the question and answer and the other is in the chat if you want to read. Um, I can tell you, you let me, Davide, uh, about the first question because rate incentives serves uh, only if the line of credit is properly applied. So if you have a green product, then other things can there's uh, so can can help to to do something about the green products. But if the mindset is not there, the conditions of the credit don't make a difference. So there is a preliminary things to do to raise the awareness and also to make understand there could be solutions that are interesting solutions also for the one that need to bear the cost to do it. Yes. And uh, the other but question. I can tackle the second one. I, I see that the question is lifted, but that's fine. Uh, I think I got the gist of it. I think that really goes back to my initial point about financial stability, right? The, the connection between financial stability and inclusion, risk capital. And it comes down to buffers and you know i think there was something in the question talking about the importance of having buffers uh which happens a lot in the mainstream financial institutions through the international standards setting and all that so in microfinance if those buffers are not there they to the extent that they can be practical and reasonable they should be there and uh 
we saw the devastating impact of the pandemic on some of these institutions as well. So the, the ultimately, the uh, but I don't think you want to have a fast regulatory response. I don't, it's like, be careful what you wish for. You know, you want, this is a case where you want to have proactivity in planning ahead of time, rather than having the regulators go in as firefighters to do deal with things in real time. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Just uh, maybe just in addition for me for the first uh, question, uh, we for the interest rate as as uh, incentives. I think maybe uh, in some contexts it works depending on the uh, country context. Like for example, in some countries there are uh, very active uh, banking associations, for example, or uh, other organizations that promote also this one. So uh, incent the incentive approach works. But also in, in other countries, they use lending quota for this. And then it's uh, just supported by refinancing facilities where they can uh, avail of this uh, funds to be used for green lending. And uh, perhaps on the second one, uh, I, yeah, I also agree with Babak that be careful in uh, asking for a quick regulatory response. But what, what I can say is what we've seen so far, especially in the Pacific, is uh, they have this uh, refinancing facilities that is, uh, at least in the central bank, that is ready to support financial institutions uh, when disasters happen. But, but I guess that's uh, stemming from long years of experience of being ex exposed to these climate-related events. So unfortunately, our time uh, is uh, over and uh, we would have liked to keep on discussing because uh, questions are becoming challenging and can really generate debate and we have clearly a nice set of panelists where we can really engage into the various dynamics of job generate uh, an interesting answer for, for everyone. Um, I would like to please uh, the people that has been attended to the events. Yeah, with this, with please. It was really, really an honor to be possible to speak with you. I would like to thank the, of course, the speakers, yeah, for uh, for your brilliant presentation and your engagement, uh, Janet, Babak, and Margarita. Um, I really think we have nice things ahead. Yeah, uh, we really um, need to start working together more and more, and really see how we can motivate from various angles regulatory. Uh, client-based civil society, financial interests, etc., the transition toward a climate sustainable economy. And I would like us to say not only climate, let's not try to have the risk that now we do everything climate friendly and then we forget about, I don't know, we need maybe to do uh, waste climate friendly or biodiversity as well. So let's try to tackle the problem uh, from uh, where it makes it sustainable at large. Um, so, Thanks a lot for everyone. Um, I see Babak, you have the, your hands rent. And if you want to add something, it's fine. Okay. Yes, and uh, you can contact our speakers. You can contact us. Uh, we will enjoy to facilitate the relationship between MFIs, network investor, regulator, and all the members of the MFP. I think this is something we would like to do more and more in the future. That's just the beginning. So please keep it up and uh, join the rest of the conference. Thank you. It's great. Bye-bye. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thanks, everyone. Bye.